Hi, everyone, and welcome to the WIM Podcast. Women in Influencer Marketing is a first-of-its-kind exclusive networking group made up of inspirational women. This podcast is where we explore influencer marketing and get real about women in business. Find us wherever you download podcasts, and of course, you can always find us at IamWim.com. That's IamWim, double I, dot com. Hey, guys, and welcome back to the Women in Influencer Marketing podcast. My name is Jesse Grossman. I'm your host and also the founder of this incredible community. Um, I'm super happy to have you guys here today for so many reasons. Number one, we have a great guest. Number two, we have lots going on in our community. And number three, I just happen to freaking love podcasting. So it's nice to just like have a conversation and know that like really awesome people like yourself are going to be listening or else I wouldn't be doing it. (laughs) So one to the stuff that we have coming up in the community, super exciting. We have really, really cool events. Depending on when this episode airs, we may have just come off of having a dinner, an IRL dinner here in New York City um, that we are capping at 50 people because that many people want to show up, which is mind blowing, but also like kind of makes sense. I feel like people are really into in-person stuff again. I know I am. It's really refreshing being in person with some people. And I know how enthusiastic it you can get when you feel like you want to be in a room with people that you admire and just like want to rub elbows with. So that's what our dinner is. I'm super excited about that. We're going to be going on a little bit of a tour throughout a lot of different cities, not just New York. We're going to be doing LA. We're going to be doing Chicago. And we're also talking about some other markets for these dinners and events. So keep an eye out for that. Those are definitely going to be coming up in always super fun, bringing me back like pre-pandemic vibes because we used to do events in all these cities. It's just been a long time. So we're bringing it back. Also, we have a really wonderful guest today and I knew that she was going to be wonderful before we even recorded the episode. Why? Because she's been on the podcast before. She's a mentor as part of WIM and she's even taught a masterclass for us. So who am I talking about? I'm talking about Joanna B. Voss. She is a wonderful talent manager. Um, She's trusted by her social influencers who want clarity on how to build their brands, how to grow their business, and just like earn their worth and also just plan strategically for the future. She's closed about three and a half million dollars worth of brand deals, partnerships, and speaking engagements. And her clients have partnered with huge brands that I know you've heard of, like Kroger, Walmart, ARP, H&R Block, Aldi, so many more to list. Negotiations are something she thoroughly enjoys, whether it be for her clients, friends, or even with strangers. She's entering into her 12th year of business for herself, and she absolutely loves being an entrepreneur. We talk about that a lot in this week's episode. I love her history. I think it's super fascinating. So it's worth mentioning again, because prior to her work as a talent manager in the influencer marketing space, she worked on presidential campaigns of Hillary Clinton and John Kerry for more than seven years. She's also a world traveler. She's lived in Spain three times. We talk a little bit about her upbringing in this episode where she has family in England, which is super cool. Her mother is is British. Um, And she can also often be found cycling Colorado's mountain ranges because she's based in Denver. Um, You can find her beautifully active Instagram account at Joanna Voss, and um, we'll be linking all of that below. Um, I hope you enjoy this episode. I hope you also check out our events page because not only do we have dinners, but we have really great virtual events coming up. Too many to name. It's all at IamWim.com slash events. And IamWim is I-A-M-W-I-I-M.com slash events. And my last thing to say, if you are not a member of WIM yet, you are severely missing out. And yes, I'm judging you. (laughs) I'm lovingly judging you because I have witnessed the magic of being a member of this organization and I can attest 
to the insane amount of value that our members have gotten. They're hiring people from WIM. They're getting hired from WIM. I just talked to somebody the other day. I just like reached out to catch up and she's like, I don't know if I ever told you. Did I ever tell you that my current job like I got from WIM? And I was like, no. And why didn't you? Like, I love hearing those stories. And I she's worked there now for a few years. So it's so cool to hear the amount of like the power in just like bringing incredible people together. I feel like the word networking has such a taboo. And the reality is it's just what I just described. Like all that it is, is just bringing incredible people together, being in the right place at the right time and being amongst really wonderful people is absolutely going to influence who you are and what you do and and who you do it with is a really powerful thing. So stick with Wim. We got you. We got your back and we will always be giving you things like we just sent out a, a promo code to another industry event. We're always giving out discounts. We're having events, educational stuff, but at our core, we're just an incredible community and you can get to know really, really um, amazing people in the industry just for being a member. So I hope you check us out. I am whim.com. And without further ado, let's get into this week's episode. Well, I'm super excited to have you on the podcast again, this is our second time, must have meant that you said some really interesting stuff the first time around. So thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Hopefully I'll deliver something interesting and exciting today too. I was going to say no pressure, but like the first time was pretty good. I'm hoping that this time is going to be even better. So for those listening or watching who didn't happen to catch the first episode, we'll totally link that below. We were also chatting before we started recording about like you did a whole master class for WIM. So we found like a whole library of Joanna <laughs> and like what she's got, you know, everything in, in, in her repertoire of industry stuff. But today we're going to talk about like some different stuff. But before we do, I know there are definitely obviously going to be people tuning in who this is their first time getting to know you. So I think it'd be cool this time. And we didn't really cover this in any of our last sessions together. I want to learn a little bit more about you, like how you grew up a little bit and even like what you were like as a kid. I think it'll be really interesting to hear because of course that indicates how you became the woman you are today. So tell us a little bit more about your, your upbringing. Yeah. It's funny thinking about it. You know, you don't often reflect back, but when you asked this question, I was like, oh yeah, I feel like it makes total sense like where I am now compared to, you know, how I grew up. So I am from Connecticut. I'm a proud Connecticutian, definitely a proud New Englander and East Coaster, born and raised. And my mom's from London. My dad's from Boston. That always made for interesting conversations in elementary school when we were studying the Revolutionary War. I will say that. Uh, I have two passports, dual citizenship between England and America. So that's just another little fun fact. I have a younger brother. There's four of us. We are super tight, super close family. That is something that has carried with me through my life. It's like family and friends and my loved ones are like number one in my life. Everyone knows it. All my friends know my family and vice versa. And I absolutely adore my family, my extended family, everybody. I'm a total bookworm. I still am to this day. Some of my earliest memories are going to the library and walking out with like many books as I can carry, stacks of them. And I would just sit and read for hours on end. To this day, it is one of the things that still brings me the most pleasure and is something that just grounds me. If I'm kind of a little crazy and frenetic, I just get a book and I just need to like lose myself in a book. And I think I've read like 65 books so far this year. Like I legit am a voracious bookworm. That's insane. Okay, wait, I have a question. Are you more of a like hold it in your hand type, turn the page book person? Not So not an audio, not a Kindle? Nope. So I've read 67 books. I've decided this year to track them. That is true. That is also not counting books that I started and then didn't like and I stopped reading, which is something I now do. I don't try and suffer through books I don't like. Not audio. I am not an audio learner. I have listened to, I think, one audio book and it was actually on a CD in 2004 when I was driving cross country after the general election. I used to work on political campaigns for eight years and it was Bill Clinton's 
biography book, the one that was like this big. And I think that was the only time I've ever listened to a book on CD. I'm not a Kindle. I've never owned a Kindle. I could never, like I traveled around the world for a year and I would lug books from hostel to hostel and like read what whatever was available. So yeah, I'm very much like a tangible book person. I love memoirs. I love mostly nonfiction, political biographies. I think I read like every book on every political figure, political biographies, memoirs, biographies. I love generational sagas and memoirs. So, you know, like Wild Swans, for example, is about three women. There's like a grandma, a mom, and a daughter. Like I love those kind of books that reflect back and forth on the cross generations. I love those sort of stories like Pachinko and Orchid House. I don't have a favorite book and I never really, I never reread books. So I share that because it was very much like, I'm also a Pisces. So we're very like dreamy and imaginative and creative and kind of just like often in our own, in our own little world. And that is still true to this day. Like I'm still very dreamy. I'm still very creative. I'm still very imaginative. I remember playing for hours on end in my bedroom. I had two games. I would play library and I would, you know, put those like slip cards in the back cover, which is, you know, what you used to check out and you'd get the stamp. Like I would put those in the books And then I would play veterinarian when I was like the front desk and welcoming the pets in for their vaccines and like surgeries and stuff. So I, I just remember sitting for hours in my bedroom and self-entertaining. And to this day, I can self-entertain incredibly well. That's so interesting because you said you have three other siblings or four other siblings. I have one other sibling. Oh, you have one other sibling. I obviously must heard you. Okay, I'm glad I clarified that. But still, like, I guess the, my point is like, it's interesting. You had a sibling. I'm an only child. And so I can self-entertain. I don't know. I guess it does like depend on the personality. Like how, how much older or younger is your sibling? So my brother's two years younger and we are super tight. And so yes, I can self-entertain very well, but we also had so many adventures. Like there was a stream next to our house. We lived at the bottom of a hill. So we would sled, you know, in the winters and snow, my friends and his friends, like all through, you know, if you look at all the pictures, it's like all of our friends, cause we're only two years apart. I don't know necessarily that our friends overlap, but we're constantly in gatherings with like some of my friends and some of his friends, you know, into high school. Like I would go to parties and my friends would show up at my house to see if I was there and I wasn't there and they would like grab my brother and then I, my brother would like roll up at a party. And even now, like my friends all know each other and like still text and stuff. So I could play very well by myself, but I'm also like, yeah, I had just tons of fun and adventure with my brother and my family. We would go camping. That was like our vacation. We went camping for, you know, a week or two and bike rides and we were canoeing and just lots of like outdoor, not like crazy outdoor stuff. Cause it was Connecticut. It wasn't like, you know, Colorado or New Hampshire or something, but we did a lot of just like outdoor fun activities. We were always, and we still are very much together as a family and still super connected as a family unit. So it's really refreshing to hear that you're so connected to your family, like even to this day. And like, I've been transparent on this podcast before. Like I'm actually like a strange from some of my family and stuff like that. And I'd love to hear from you. Like, what do you think it is that like really bonds you guys together? Like how have you been able to maintain such a really lovely relationship over so many years? Yeah. I think a lot of it has stemmed from what I've learned and seen from my parents, right? It's definitely one of those things where I thought it was normal that everyone, like I pen pal with a couple aunts of mine, text with aunts and uncles and cousins and like tend to be the one that brings different family members together. Like, oh, so-and-so cousins in town. Okay, let's have a dinner party and like invite the other cousins that are around. And my mom is super close, even though there's miles that separate them from here to England. I've always been super connected to my English family. There's never been like blowouts. There's never been fights. There's never been people are, there's no drama, which I think is a huge help. We don't get drunk. We don't drink at parties. Like I think that helps, you know, I've heard a lot of people just, it seems like a lot of times fights stem from like too much booze at a party. And then someone like, you know, has an issue from like 20 years ago that comes back up again. There's lots of reasons for, you know, on paper for the family to have disagreed and, you know, somebody died and there's like my dad's one of six, right? So there's like lots of siblings that are involved in sort of the passing of the torch. And but yeah, they're all we're all just super connected. Like we gather a couple times a year, everyone gets along. We all look forward to it. We all love it. Like we have a family group email. During COVID, we started Zooming like I think every other week for like a year. I visited extended family in Virginia because I love learning. I love like 
ancestry stuff and genealogy. Like I could geek out on that stuff forever. So I've met extended family. Like I've gone on trips with a cousin to meet extended family and like we've pulled them into our COVID Zooms and stuff. And like I still text and chat with them. So yeah, I guess I could say I just probably learned it from my parents and I guess I hit the jackpot there. It sounds like you're like incredibly participatory in it. And in fact, like it almost sounds like you're the glue in some instances. You're like, let's get together. Let's do this. Let's do that. So certainly not like a passive role, but yes, like it takes two to tango. So it's really nice to have like lovely family members who will meet you where you are and totally like do the thing with you. So that's awesome. I'd love to hear also. So it's, I mean, I remember in our last conversation, you were talking about how you used to work in politics and political campaigns. And I was like, oh, tell me more. That's so fascinating. I am such a, like a news junkie. So we won't rehash that, but it's cool to hear that again. And if anyone else wants to hear more, totally listen to our past conversations. I think I'd also love to learn from you what you like to do outside of work today, especially living in a beautiful place like Colorado. And how it informs the work that you do. Like, does it give you time away from work to feel more rejuvenated? Or does it really help you focus more? Or I don't know, how does your pastimes and fun activities make you a better business person? Okay. So I live in Colorado. It is gorgeous. I live in Denver. I love cities. I've got the mountains. Again, luckiest woman. I mean, I went running this morning. I work out a couple days a week. I ride my bike when it's not cold and snowing. And then when it's cold and snowing, I go off and have winter adventures, either snowshoeing or skate skiing, which is kind of like cross country, but like way harder and way more fun. I love hosting dinner parties. I love sitting in coffee shops and exploring. I don't know. I kind of just love like random new stuff. I love adventure. Like that is spontaneity and random are some top values for me. Things that I've just learned that both in my business and in my personal life keep me fueled. Like I I really love that. Like, oh, there's a new coffee shop two towns over and like, it has this cool story. I'm like, okay, cool. I'll go sit there and like work there for the morning. I know now being 43 that that time away is what allows me to do really well when I'm in my job. I know it is so hard, especially when you're starting to like take time off because you're like, oh my God, there's so many things to do. And like, I could do this and I can do that. I am not creative in certain times of the day, the week, my cycle. I'm really tuned in and connected to that. And I don't try and push a square peg in a round hole because we've all sat there when you, you know, take four hours to do an email. You're like, that literally could have taken me seven minutes and I'm so distracted or whatever. So when I have those moments, I just walk away. I'm like, okay, what has to happen? What's like the emergency? What am I in the middle of? And then I'll just turn my computer off and like walk away. Or actually I'll go read a book. Maybe I'll go do something active because I know that it's not worth just sitting there. Like it's much more beneficial for me to check out. To that exact point, like I think it's beautiful personally, like what you've created for yourself. Like you work for yourself, you have your own company. It seems like you've always had like a really clear vision on what you want to create. Maybe it's just my perception of it, but it seems like you're like, no, I'm good. Like I've built what I want. Like this is the type of growth that I want. This is exactly what I'm looking for. And like, it's here and I love it. It's really exciting to see that. My question is like, it's wonderful to hear that you're architecting even the day-to-day that you're looking to experience where like, if I'm not feeling it, I'm not going to white knuckle my way through it. And that's like a beautiful thing to be able to do. What do you say though, to those who feel pressured to meet deadlines or to do what their boss is telling them to do and don't necessarily like have the freedom that you do Should they seek it out? Should they just acquiesce? Like, I don't know. What are your thoughts on those who do feel the pressure? I'm sure you feel the pressure too. So I don't know. What do you have to say about those folks? Yeah, it is obviously easier for me because I work for myself and I'm not on the rat race, like treadmill by any means. This is a good question. So if you are working for someone and you're feeling that pressure, I think having a really strong sense of self even if it's just like using this industry as an example. So let's say you're in the either the agency side, the brand side, or like you're working on a talent management agency. I'll just use contracts, for example, right? Fine details, like things you have to really pay attention to. If your boss is on you about getting something done, if you're able to have a conversation and say, hey, such and such boss person, coming forward with a solution and like, I understand that this needs to happen. I would love to have 
until noon tomorrow because my best time to read agreements and make sure I don't miss any details is in the morning. I've blocked my calendar for this, et cetera, et cetera, versus saying, oh, I can't do it tonight. I can't do it tonight. I don't want to do it tonight. Like I'm much more a proponent of propose a solution that is positive. Your boss wants to get the job done, right? Your boss doesn't want you to mess things up. Your boss wants hopefully you to be happy and, you know, be in a good work environment and work culture. So I think if you're feeling that pressure from above, maybe identify one or two things that are that those pain points and think of like what the pivot is where you can suggest something that is positive to help your boss see your perspective and understand that you're a human and you know why you may need to do something tomorrow or maybe they're on your case for working after hours but maybe like listen that's when I do my best thinking my kids in bed dinner's over you know whatever my boyfriend's watching his show and I can have an hour like that's actually when I do my best work I think communicating like having a strong sense of self which I don't think a lot of people do because we're kind of caught up in what everyone else thinks and wants right it's hard to just sit literally sit with yourself. But the more that you're able to do that and understand your best standard operating procedure, and then being able to communicate that in a way that is positive to whomever needs to hear that information, that would be what I would say if you're working for someone else and feeling that pressure. I hope that made sense. Oh, it makes total sense. And you know what? I also just want to add to that too. So you're talking about like having a really strong sense of self. And I agree wholeheartedly with that. You know what I think people don't talk about enough though? Like when I hear that, I think my initial instinct is like, yeah, like know what you're good at. Like I also think that having a strong sense of self is being okay and accepting of like what your weaknesses are and where you're messy and the things that are like quote unquote kind of negative or kind of not looked at as well. So I don't know. I just want to like add that too because I think that's a real true sense of self. But The step further, yeah, like communicate it and be confident in the way you communicate it, right? Like stand firm and have a strong sense of self when you're communicating your sense of self. I think that's really important. So you mentioned how you're in beautiful Denver, Colorado. And I think that like of all places to feel sort of grounded and find like, you know, who I am deep down inside, it's like a beautiful place to be able to freaking discover that. I also know that you mentioned that you had an event in Denver recently, which I want to dig into this. I feel like myself included, so many people are really amped up about doing in-person events again. We've been like locked down in quarantine. And then when we weren't, I was like, is it safe? Is it responsible to get people together? And it sounds like you had a pretty successful in-person industry event. So I don't know. Tell us all about it. I want to hear more. Yeah. So honestly, it was like the legit most badass, coolest thing I've ever done. And my clients will totally back me up on that. Everyone, they're already like, when are we doing this again? We have to do this at least once a year. So all of my clients, seven women came to Denver from all corners of the country for four days. Everyone arrived on Wednesday. And then a couple people started to bounce on Friday. A couple people had to leave on Saturday. And then the last person left on Sunday. And we didn't have an agenda. So originally we were planning in the fall of 2019. So three years ago, which is so crazy to think about, we were organizing something for April of 2020. I had rented a big Airbnb. People had bought tickets. Everyone was coming to Denver for just a gathering, just to hang out and like have a good time together. Well, we all know how that went. That didn't happen. So they've all been on my case to do something. And I was kind of like, I don't know, you know, have everyone. Do I want people to travel? Like it just didn't happen. And then probably six months ago, I thought, okay, I want this to happen. I need to pick a date because everyone's calendar is crazy. So we picked this date probably six months ago, come to Denver. And I've been trying to be better about a couple times a year having just an everybody like, okay, we're all going to hop on a Zoom. I'm going to block this time off for an hour, come for the hour, come for half an hour, come for 50 minutes, come say hi, whatever works. And so on that call, I'd ask them like, what do you want to do? Like, what do you want me to organize? Like everyone just kind of wanted to hang out and just connect and chat and get to know one another. Cause not everybody knew everybody. I had met everyone, but that wasn't the case with everyone else. And so it's mostly just like get together in person and hang out. And one of the ideas that came up was doing a video. I don't know how I look back and I'm like, how did this whole video thing happen? So everyone arrived on Wednesday. We had a first like dinner, meet and greet, hang out, delicious food at Linger in Denver. And then Thursday, I hired a videographer 
rented a studio, had a photographer. We made a video that's going to go on my website that is so badass. I saw it last night. I had to go in and record the voiceover for one section. And I saw kind of like a clip of it, maybe about 85% done. Honestly, it gave me chills and I was getting all choked up. I think I was getting choked up because there's so much about this world that's intangible, right? We're all online. It's all digital. Like I'm in my office, you know, I don't see a ton of clients often, but having that video with all of my clients there, it captured us. It's this one shot, speaking of agencies and brands that would hire my clients, speaking about us and like what we're all about and what we do and like, come hire us and like kind of literally giving a taste of what we're like. And it just did such a great job capturing us and our personality and the fun, like, oh my God, I've never laughed so hard. So we did the video that kind of folded into a photo shoot on Thursday, had a dinner Thursday night together, breakfast Friday. And then we just like walked around Denver and hung out. There was no, like I had things kind of planned out, but it was very loose. Like, okay, we're not ready for lunch yet, but we're going to go do this. And then we'll actually move dinner up and have dinner earlier and go get drinks. And everyone loved it. And it I knew it was going to be good. I'm obsessed with my clients. I love them all. They're all amazing. It was truly better than I could have imagined. Like meeting in person, being connected, you know, I just kept hugging them and like touching them and just being like, I can't believe you're here. And I was just, it was so great to have them in Denver and to host them. And I heard a couple of them saying it was kind of like a mini conference in that, you know, you go to a conference And that the actual takeaways, right? Like the best things that you scribble in your notepads that you go back and that you do differently in your business, the changes that you make or the person that you hire come from those conversations in the elevator, or you meet someone in line for the bathroom, or you're standing there at the lunch buffet and you're talking to someone and that's the conversation that you connect with. And they're like, oh no, my VA is this person. Or like, oh, there's this Facebook group that's super revolutionary. Or like, hey, let me give you the name of my person who helped me with SEO or oh, here's an app that I use to make videos for reels. Like it's literally the simplest, not dumb, but like just simplest things. It was basically four days of that. So like every conversation was impactful. Like people had sent me questions ahead of time to ask the group kind of anonymously, or they were like, I'm just curious to know what other people are like making for ad revenue versus monetizing reels versus monetizing TikTok. You know, there were some like generic questions or some questions specific to certain people. So I would ask them, have these conversations start to happen. We would connect as a group. Some side conversations would happen. People would then like share and connect. There's since been emails and Word documents that have gone around of like people sharing all the resources of people that they work with and who they've hired and not necessarily for other people to go hire all those people, for just people to see like what other people are doing, right? Behind the scenes things. So basically the four days was like all those little conversations that are so incredibly impactful We're all just floating. And I mean, the content, oh my God, if you follow me on social, literally this is like all you're going to see for the next five years because I have (laughs) so much content. It's so good. And I'm excited to see it when it comes out. I mean, your whole energy changes when you talk about it. So like, it's a really exciting, cool thing. How did this come to be? And like, what do you attribute the success like mostly to? I'm sure people want to recreate this experience. Yeah. Well, I work my butt off to organize it. <laughs> step um, one, work first, your ass off. Yeah, that's, that's step one. I mean, I got a hotel to host us and get a couple comp nights and some media rates, which was cool. Had a couple sponsors, people who sent me things to put in welcome packets and stuff, which was also cool. Um, Those were kind of just like bonus fun add-ons. I think the thing that led to its success is it's our group. We all want to hang out with each other. We all want to support each other. We all want to be connected with one another. And we all want to spend time with one another. And clearly, it wasn't just me because everyone else, I have one client in Denver, but everyone else rearranged their life bought plane tickets, got on a plane, got themselves a Denver, got in the Uber. Like it was work, you know, not just for me, but for my talent to show up. And everybody was committed to that. You know, if you've been following me on social or know me, like, you know, I'm obsessed with my clients. Like I'm super particular about who I let into this world because of that dynamic and because of that 
balance. I always have the final say on if someone reaches out and I want to work with them, but I always check in with my other clients because they may know something or like, oh my God, I was on a photo shoot with this person. And like, they were a total diva or like, uh, they'll tell me the chatter because yes, your business matters and how well you're doing. I work off commission. Like that's just business, but on a much deeper sort of intangible way, like your personality and who you are, how you show up, your mindset, how much are you willing to be part of the group? How much are you just like, you know, not wanting to contribute? We are greater with the whole of our parts than us individually. And so it wasn't something I would have been able to articulate a little while ago, but the probably this year I've been able to see us great, like our, our greater collective power rather than like, oh, I'm Joanna and I represent Yvette and Ale and Lorraine. It's like, no, no, no. They all think about how they represent everybody else and our agency. I know not everyone has the dynamic. I have a small boutique agency that is by default originally, and now it's by design. There are other agencies who are, you know, in growth mode and want to scale and like bring on more talent managers and manage more talent. That's not where I'm at. Like it is only ever going to be me. I'm very clear on that because if any one of them was like a bad apple or rude or cranky or like didn't have the right attitude, it would have been a completely different ball game. And I never once had to worry about that because they're all like obsessively emailing me and texting me about like, oh my God, I can't wait for this and that. And I can't wait to talk to Laura about this. And like, I want to connect about Ali about this. It's like everyone, like I was the one who said, okay, come to Denver, here are these dates, get on a plane. But collectively we all contributed to make it a success. Well, and there's a really powerful thing for being the person who brings the right people together, like the people who are meant to collaborate and do really cool shit together. And like, that's a really powerful thing, just like getting people in the same room, like that energy compounded by the amount of people that are in that room. I mean, that's electric. Like you really freaking feel that. What were your goals though, going into it? Speaking of like this energy, like, was it for them to collaborate? Was it for them to generate new business? Or was it just to sort of like watch and learn and sort of experiment with an event and see what happens? It wasn't to make new business. That was not ever like on the radar. It was to first and foremost, especially when I was thinking about it back in April of 2020, I just want everyone together. I just want everyone to connect. I hate to say network because it's like, we all know each other. We're all just like hanging out together, but to strengthen their relationships with each other. And I wanted them all to leave sad to go and asking me about when the next one would be, you know, I wanted them to leave wanting more, not to be like, okay, I'm good. I'm fulfilled. I've learned everything I need to know. And I'm ready to leave now. That was not the case. Everyone was like, who had to leave I mean, obviously, eventually, unfortunately, they had to leave much as I tried to hold on to them and get them to stay in Denver forever. Nobody wanted to leave. Everyone's like, we're still obsessively texting and DMing and messaging about ideas that happened and connections and like, oh, remember that conversation? If I had to pick one thing, that was it. It was just to have that connection strengthened between all of us and to build those relationships. So it wasn't just, you know, me to each of them, but the ones that didn't know each other to kind of just like strengthen our web of our agency and, you know, of our group and our crew. Awesome. So you were speaking a lot about your clients and whenever you talk about them, your face lights up. Like I know that you are very particular about, like you said, who you let in, but for good reason. Cause like once they're in, like, it seems like they're all your kids. Like they're all like, I'm totally their momager. They call me their momager all the time. And honestly, because this is the first time we were together with the group, we're getting in the Uber. I'm like, okay, is everybody here? And I would literally go down the list in my head to like make sure everyone was there. I was like, I feel like your mother right now. So yes, they are my kids. They seem like it in like all of the beautiful ways, you know, like you talk about them, like you're so proud of them and the work that they're doing and just helping and supporting them. So I love to sort of get like a little bit of a behind the scenes peek into how you work with all these incredible clients. Cause like, I know that like, if they're a client of yours, like you have vetted them and like, you feel so strongly about working with them. I'd love to know, like for maybe like your most lucrative client, you can or cannot name who that is. It doesn't matter. The point that I would love to dig into is what advice do you give your most lucrative client to navigate their career and like, meet their goals, whatever they are. And then maybe you have another one who's like struggling to achieve their goals, but maybe have a lot of potential. What advice would you give each of them? So the first one about advice, the most lucrative client or clients is 
I remind them at the end of the day, it's their brand. It's their choice. You know, they can say yes to a brand. They can say no to a brand that has a lot of money, no money. I'm like, no one's judging you. And nobody knows behind the scenes if you got paid or if you didn't. I'm not judging you. You know, I present the information to them. I'm like, okay, here's this project. If they ask, I'll be like, yes, it may be less than your rate, but like, here's why I think you should do it. Bigger picture stuff, you know, the network, the connections, the opportunity, their client portfolio, you know, the goals where I know they want to get to. But I often remind them because they imagine that perhaps sometimes as you get more successful, perhaps, you know, especially if you hire a team and you have more salaries to pay that people might get a little away from remembering that this is all theirs. They can say yes or no to whatever they want. They don't have to do anything. So I often remind my top earners about that, that I'm like, do you want to do it? Like, do you like it? Do it. You know, if it's a project that brings you joy and you're excited about it and it makes sense for your brand and you've been wanting to redo this video thing and like, now you have a chance to redo the video. Like, great, go for it. Or conversely, give them the permission. If it is a seemingly well-paid project, I give them the permission to say no. If, you know, the agency is being a pain in the butt or it's been super stressful or like the timing's not right, I just remind them it's it's their choice. And then the other thing too is just not to overthink it. That's the big thing that came up during our retreat last week was to stop overthinking things. You know, I have a lot of my clients who've been doing this for 10, 12 years who Googled, you know, like what is a blog, started their websites and their brands to put recipes so their family and friends could find them. Like there was no visions of grandeur. This industry didn't even really exist the way that it does right now. So that is different compared to another client of mine who was much younger. And when she came in in the space, it was an industry. It is an industry. You can study it in school. You know, she could decide that she was going to make a business of it versus other clients who sort of not like they were on the forefront, like they're the deciding ones, but they were in the, you know, just by nature of them being around as long as they have, it's been more unfolding as they've been progressing forward. And this group can learn from this group and vice versa. I think the people that started earlier in this industry didn't start it as a business and now it's become a business. It's much more planning, much more long content, you know, editorial calendars and stuff like that. And now it's much more just quick, like, TikTok, I'm going to my phone. Ooh, I'm in a moment. Bada bing, bada boom. Okay, something. Make this video. TikTok, send it out. Grab a trending audio. Done. That's new. And so that is a piece of advice, especially when you layer in like type A perfectionists, is to stop overthinking stuff. Not like, oh, go be trendy, go do everything on TikTok, but just stop overthinking. Stop worrying about that perfection because people aren't as particular in noticing. And there's so much more content. And there's so much more noise now. That's two pieces of advice is like, you can make your own choices. This is your business and your brand and stop overthinking it. Then conversely, the person who maybe is having not their best year or maybe has gotten a little bit off track, I would just revisit. I have had this conversation. I will be having it again. Is just revisiting like, what is your brand? You know, it can change because maybe you had kids and your kids are older. Maybe your kids have left the house and now you're empty nesters or you got married, you got divorced, you moved. I mean, there's lots of reasons to relook at your brand and relook at your content and just to ensure that it all makes sense. The conversations are that like, okay, what is your brand? What's the value you're providing? What's the service you're providing? Who are you serving? Okay, let's look at your content. Are those aligning? A lot of times when they're not, you can tell the business opportunities have dropped off. And so it's just like recalibrating and maybe it's archiving some old photos. It's getting photo shoots back on the calendar. You know, coming out of COVID, a lot of people dropped routines. We weren't having scheduled photo shoots and content creation, going out and doing things the way people were pre-COVID in terms of running your business. So that was a bit of a disruptor for a lot of people. And so just re-looking at, what's the word I'm looking for? Not doing like a, oh, the word has totally escaped me, but just like reviewing your, you know, reviewing your content and just making sure it's all still aligned and then kind of rejiggering to make sure you're getting back on that track. I've had that conversation with clients in the past and She's got her stuff back online and it's great to see that her hard work has been paying off because she's been having a a banner second half of this year after sort of chatting with her earlier this year. So those are the conversations I would have with someone who is not like having their best year. And honestly, sometimes this is a total crapshoot. We have no idea why brands pick who they pick when you have 10 people that are all similar. So sometimes you're also just kind of at the whim of people's budgets and decisions. 
Totally. I appreciate that. I I feel like we got a good sense of like, it's fun to hear like a stream of thought from you, you know, like, and how you'd advise them and what to think about. And I don't know if I were an influencer, like I would want to be represented by you. I feel like you're like very thoughtful. I mean it about the advice that you give, have a ton of knowledge, but also like you're very down to earth and like you, you have like a very grounded perspective, I think. And as an influencer, like I think that would mean a lot. Think about same spirit. There's so many people who work in influencer marketing. It's wild. Like the title of our industry, it's called influencer marketing. And I feel like influencers aren't enough of a focus sometimes. And here's what I mean by that. I feel like there's a lot of people who hire influencers that have never like actually worked directly with them, like how you have to really get a sense of how they tick and what they're like and what they're all about and what's important and not important to them and stuff like that. So you also have such a day-to-day intimate relationship with so many really incredible creators. Could you give us a sense of something like we might not know about what it is to be an influencer and like what they do on a day-to-day, just something you don't think we know about influencers? Yeah. So I think something I run into often Sweeping generalization about to happen. So brands and agencies, seems like a lot of times they forget these people are humans. They've got lives. Yes, it's a business, but perhaps they have other work. Perhaps they're homeschooling, women being in the sandwich generation of caring for parents and kids, maybe cross country lines and doing it internationally, cross, you know, different language barriers, not barriers, but like, you know, cross different languages and and across different country lines and time zones and those other people in their lives. And even if they're single, it doesn't exclude those people because those people have lives and families and friends and obligations and stuff. But it's just sometimes I see brands with like this quick turnaround time. And I'm like, you don't just want them to like, you love them for their content, which are like these professional photos. That means they work with a photographer. So they have, you know, the, the photographer takes the pictures works on them. The photographer has other projects. It's like, sometimes there's this expectation of a quick turn or like, you know, you email me at four o'clock on a Friday mountain time. I'm like, you are done working East coast time and wanting things end of day. And I'm like, it is end of day. Like there's just sometimes these expectations that to me give light that it is forgotten that influencers are humans. And they are living their lives, no matter how successful their business is, and no matter how many people they have on their team, or if they're a one woman show and that's all they want to do and that's fine. It's just like these crazy um, requests and and expectations of like turnaround time, availability, and like, you want a recipe. You can't just whip off a recipe. Like you want an original recipe, recipe creation. You got to figure it out. Go to the grocery store, get some ingredients, recipe test two or three times before they have the recipe. Check nutritional guidelines to make sure it fits within your guardrails of fats and sodium and all of the things. It's like that takes time. And so I just so often see that part, that human element is lost in my conversations and emails I have about different projects and people reaching out to hire my talent. I can really appreciate that. I've certainly witnessed it too. And I don't even know if it's important to like analyze like why people lose sight of that, but like, I don't know. It's just like, it's unkind too. And like the amount of expectations that are placed on people. And I think that like, this comes up a lot on this podcast, which is just like, can people have more empathy? Can people like also take a little bit more time to even just like understand the process of the other, (laughs) the other party of the partnership? I mean, if it's a real partnership, isn't that part of it? Isn't that a component of it? So in that vein, it's really exciting to see people like yourselves who are starting their own talent management companies. It's such a cool side of influencer marketing where like you can be incredibly entrepreneurial and make a killing and help influencers and like facilitate deals and just like have your own incredible company. In a lot of instances, like a marginal amount of up start costs. And it's really cool to see how successful 
one person can be, don't get me wrong, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of expertise and being really good at a lot of different things because you wear a lot of hats. But I would love to hear advice from you for somebody who's starting out in talent management today. Maybe they worked at another agency and they wanted to like, oh, I really like so prefer to represent talent and just go out on my own and do this. Or maybe they're just graduating school but are there any things that you wish you had maybe done differently or things that you did particularly right when you were first starting out as a talent manager? Okay. Things I did right kind of goes back to what I was saying at the very beginning of this is a strong sense of self. I listen to my gut. I trust my gut. I have very clear like my pillars of what is important to me personally, professionally, and I'm okay walking away from that. I know that takes work again, when you're like 25 and 26 and, or starting a business at whatever age, like there is that element of like, Oh my God, I just have to say yes to projects. Keep the lights on. I've been there. I get it. But this is my answer. Having now lots of years, 12 or so years working for myself and that wisdom, I would recommend or offer some thought to someone who is wanting to start their own talent management agency or go off in that direction is do it on the side. Meaning like when I started my business, as a nutrition coach, 2011, I think, January, 2011, I had put all the eggs in that basket. I wasn't working a job to make sure the bills were getting paid. And I had this on the side. So it was very, very stressful. And I think I spoke about this in the past podcast. It is something that is advice that I would say, like, don't do it that way. Don't put all that stress and like having to make the job that you want to happen, like have to happen because it just has, you just get a different relationship with the clients and the work and the projects. So if you want to do talent management, do it on the side. Take on someone who's maybe starting or just beginning or like reaching out and maybe quite isn't at the level. Maybe they wouldn't quite yet be like the perfect client because their income of your commission doesn't quite sustain like a full-time work. But do it on the side to learn and understand how this works, to go through multiple cycles, to do client projects, to have lots of brand negotiations, to understand like so much of this is a no before you get to the yes. Like that takes a certain thing to, you know, I've talked to a lot of people who, oh, I pitched 10 clients and, or I pitched 10 brands and like nothing happened. And I'm like, yeah. And like, keep going. That's just the nature of this. You know, I probably say no to 80 to 85% of the projects that come in for my clients. And I've actually just done the math. They're almost at 900 inbound inquiries for this year. That is a lot of no's. So having someone that you do want, you know, you work with on the side where you can go through the motions and learn. And it isn't that like high pressure, high stakes. I've launched my agency and like, now I have to make it work. There's a lot on the line. You want to understand agreements and contracts and the different language and like whitelisting and usage and And what does all that mean? Because you're representing your clients and you want to make sure that you're setting them up for success and that you're not putting them in a situation where they're like, wait, I didn't agree to have my face on a billboard. And then you're like, oops, I didn't think to look about like in print usage, you know, kind of learn mentor shadow someone. And I don't mean for like a month, three months. I literally mean for like six months, nine months, like this is a marathon thing, have a long-term strategy that will contribute, I think, much greater to your success than just kind of like trying to wing it and scramble and figure things out on the fly. That's what I did. It's mostly worked out for me. But I also was in politics for eight years. And it's a lot of the same, you know, you ask 10 people for one person to say yes kind of thing. So I had a lot of that like mindset and training, which I really do think has done me a great service to be successful at what I'm doing now and just to be an entrepreneur in general. But a lot of people don't do that. And a lot of people are put out five emails and like, no one got back to me. I'm like, okay. So you either revisit your email or you just keep at it. That's kind of the nature of this beast. Oh my God. You're like speaking my language. I, people who will definitely remain nameless. I've been- Oh yeah, I got some. (laughs) Just like there. It sounds like we have some names that like and instances that we're thinking of where I'm just like, dude, you're just beginning. Why are you so discouraged already? Like, why are you letting this get to you? Like- I don't know. I feel like a lot of people like blame things like that on like generational things or who knows what. But I just think that it's a personality thing and it certainly contributes to how you're raised. I do think that's sort of why I wanted to get into like, how did you become the woman that you are today? I do think our upbringings and really contribute in a really big way, of course, to like 
How much tenacity do you have? Like your work ethic, like how many no's are you comfortable hearing? And talent management is not for the faint of heart at all whatsoever. My last question to you is on the other side. So these are for people, your question before is beautiful answering like for people who are starting out in talent management, getting comfortable, having tenacity, things like that. Is there any advice that you would give to somebody who's like well on their journey, been a talent manager for a while, things that maybe they should keep in mind or think about maybe doing in a certain way that's just helped you a lot in your business? Yes. Know your pillars. Just have that sense of self with pillars of like what's super important to you. Because I think when you're, you are successful, right? It's like, wow, I have this person who's making X amount of money a month, a year. And then you do the 20% and you're like, oh, that's in my pocket. Like that sounds good. It can be very easy to like get caught up in that. I'm not going to lie. I want to make more money. Like I want more money. I have lots of financial goals and things and aspirations that I am still working towards that having someone who makes boatloads of money would help facilitate. But where I'm going with this is having that sense of self, because if that person compromises my values, my quality of life, I don't care how much money you're making. You are a no. I don't know that everyone's there. Like I've definitely said no to people who make lots of money because I'm like, oh, you're like already a pain in my butt. And you like are not following instructions. I've asked you to do a couple things, a couple basic things. You're not listening to me. You are infringing on my boundaries, which I have articulated, which is fine. Like I have clients who will text me over the weekend and say, I know you're not working this weekend, but I just want you to know this thing. That is different than me saying, please don't call or message me or please do it by this day. And then they just blow past and do it on their own timeline, you know, without any context. And they constantly do that. I'm like, oh, this is your, this is your behavior. Yeah. I don't care how much money people are making that to me, if you're compromising my quality of life and I'm like not excited to get an email or a text from you, that's a huge red flag. So I think it will are successful and are continuing to be successful, right? Like one measure of success is the income and the money. And that can be, you know, like a, a shiny object of having talent pop up who could, you know, you do 20% on that and they could bring you in a lot of money. So I would just say, continue to stay very clear and like true to what works for you and how you operate and don't lose sight of that. Totally. And you like, you got to trust your gut on those things too. Like, especially if you're someone like yourself, I can like, I empathize with the position you're in. I think it's a beautiful thing to have the amount of freedom that you have being a solopreneur. I'm a solopreneur as well. I have like a couple people, contractors who help, but like, I sometimes look at the other side, like other people who have lots of colleagues and I'm like, it must be nice to like bounce ideas off of people or like get other people's like, I need a gut check. Like, I need you to check me on this. Like, what is your opinion about what I'm going through? And just like a second set of eyes on things. So if you're starting out and you're doing it on your own, like it's you yourself and you. So I think that, you know, it's probably a matter of just like continuously checking in with yourself and, you know, maybe asking other people in your life. It doesn't have to be like industry related. In fact, maybe a fresh perspective is sometimes healthy to have with people in your life that you trust. So I think that's such a solid advice. And um, I think it's, it's, it's awesome to hear. It's always such a pleasure having you on the show. And I'm just excited to like share you with even more people because I love how active you are in the group. I know how giving you are to our members and you've befriended so many people who just always speak so highly of you. I just think you're like, you're like a great model of the type of people that we want in WIM, to be honest, like very supportive, very driven and have been successful in your own business. It's true. But like you're a girl's girl. Like it seems like you're very supportive of your fellow women in the industry. And I think that's a really big testament probably to how you grew up. There's some through line in there for sure. So with that being said, are there any final thoughts that you want to share with our audience before we head out today? I would say if you're here and listening, you've obviously found WIM. Kudos to you because what Jesse has grown here with this community has not gone unnoticed by me. I mean, you know, just as you've been watching my journey, Jesse, I've been watching yours and I have so much gratitude for this community that you've curated and pulled together 
I have now, you know, connected with a couple talent managers that were just like, we've got our little crew that are a resource and gut check and sounding board because we do operate kind of in a silo. And I would have never found these women if it wasn't for you. I love how people are posting, you know, casting requests and like, Hey, I need someone for this or that, or does anyone ever connect at this brand? You know, a lot of that vibe and direction has come from you. So for anyone listening, like do the membership, you're in a great spot. This is a great community of people show up, participate. You definitely get what you give. And, you know, when you were deciding to reach out to people for questions and, and want to connect and like pick people's brains, I would say come with questions. That is very helpful. Someone who gets off to, you know, frequent requests of people who want to pick my brain. I'm fine to chat with people, but I will tell you it goes a lot further. If you're like, here are my three questions. I would like to know specifically how you deal with this situation rather than like, tell me your journey. I'm like, no, because honestly you can find it in so many other places. And that to me says you're not doing like research and you're just kind of being a little lazy. So I'm so happy that you're bringing that up. That's such a good point to bring up. So it's also worth mentioning that you're part of our mentorship program as well. And I just wanted to chime in briefly to say I 1000% co-sign what you're saying right now because look, WIM is a networking organization. What you said first is so accurate, which is what you put into it, you get out of it. But like that's life. (laughs) That's just a life thing. That's not exclusively a WIM thing by any stretch of the imagination. But also like to that same point, like if you are reaching out to someone like Joanna, we're going to like absolutely list, you know, your social handles and stuff in the show notes and people can reach out to you just because you're a member of women, you're very present. When you do, if and when you do have pointed questions, I love that you brought that up. We have like a whole list of like mentorship session guidelines because of that, because I had heard people say like, so I got on this call with this person and I'm happy to be a mentor with the win, but like, they didn't really ask anything. Like, I, like I'm happy to be a resource. How do you get started? Or, or tell me more about what you do. And I'm like, are you serious? Like I am turned off is like, don't waste my time. But if I'm like, Hey, I've got 10, 15 minutes or whatever. Someone's like, can I take 15 minutes? And they have great questions. I will happily chat with them for like, half an hour, 45 minutes, do a follow-up. Like that is so much more beneficial than just like a generic, I didn't really do any research and I'm being kind of lazy. Those are annoying. 100%. Like don't be, I hate to say like, don't be something. I always like to say it in the, in the positive, like in the affirmative, but like, first of all, do research 1000%, but like, don't waste their time, but also don't even waste your own time. Like if you're going to meet with somebody that you admire, like take full advantage of that situation. What do you really, really want to ask of that person and like maximize your time together and really take full advantage of it? Again, I, I think this is like, it's interesting to talk about like in the, you know, in the sense of like a mentorship session or a, just like a phone call or a conversation or a coffee. But I love what you're saying because I also think it broadly is applicable to just life and how you approach and attack your life. So I just wanted to chime in and co-sign on that. I really appreciate you bringing that up. Again, it's been a huge pleasure having you on again. I'm such a big fan, I hope, and I'm pretty sure that you know that. So for those of you who are new to knowing about the amazingness that is your agency, like please check her out. She has incredible talent that she represents. We only like scratched the surface of why they're incredible and who they are. Just thank you for being on again today. You're the best. Thanks, Jesse. I really appreciate it. And um, yeah, I love everything you've curated here with WIM and I'm super psyched to be a part of it. And it would be weird to think of life without you and without WIM. So thank you very much for all the work that you've done to even like, you know, bring us here today. Bring us here today. When I think of WIM and I think of like some of our best members, you're absolutely always on the top of that list. And best is, you know, subjective, but it's really just because of how you show up and how you support others yeah. and how you share. And if all of our members were like you, like WIM would be like, you know, even 10 times better than it already is. So yeah. thank you guys. Thank you for joining today. So appreciate it. And we'll see you next week, guys. Take care. 
Awesome. Thanks, Jesse. If you enjoyed this episode, we got to have you back. Check out our website for more ways to get involved, including all the information you need about joining our collective. You can check out all the information at IamWim.com. Leave us a review, a rating, but the most important thing that we can ask you to do is to share this podcast. Thanks for listening. Tune in next week. Tune in next week.